Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young. Believe it or not, the Wildcats won a basketball game tonight. It did not look like they were going to do it multiple times throughout the course of this game. Then there were moments where it looked like, oh, this team is going to win, and it just didn't ever go the way you thought it would. I, I don't know that I've seen a K-State win that I felt like was more stolen at the end of the game, but it's odd because I don't want that to discredit what K-State did because they played just as well, if not better, than Baylor and deserved to win this game by the way they played. But based on what the scoreboard said and the time situation, it did not compute in my brain how they were able to overcome it, but they did. And I, there's a lot that I took away from this game as a positive for K-State. So we'll dive into all of it. But what, what's the, the generic thoughts to start things off? Yeah, with about two minutes left in the game, overtime, I, I'm speaking about not regulation. I think they were down six yep. and still won by four. So I, um, it, a lot of twists and turns in this game. Like you said, there was moments where it was like, oh, I think K-State's got this. And there was moments where it was like, there's no way. So a very unpredictable game. Basically, every time you thought something the opposite was going to unfold. Uh, like you said, I, I don't even know if I say Kansas State stole this game necessarily because you play that good a defense and hold Baylor down that well, I don't think you stole it because you deserve it on that end. It's just that Baylor couldn't make anything and Kansas State couldn't hang on to the ball. And we know that Baylor has shot poorly from three in Big 12 play, but I will say this. I can't attest to what Oklahoma State and Cincinnati did defensively. That may have just been Baylor missing shots. Tonight, there were only a handful of times where it felt like to me that Baylor got an open, really good look, and I thought, oh, boy. Outside of that, it was K-State's defense that forced Baylor to shoot it so poorly from three and give the Cats a chance on the other end. And I, I will say this. For as bad as K-State has been shooting the three-point shot this season – you're going to give yourself an opportunity if your defense is so good that you make other teams shoot the ball like you do, and that's what they did to Baylor tonight. Yeah, I, I think there was a, there, a few of them were late, which had us holding our breath a little bit yeah. uh, the, the times that they did get open. Yeah. But I also think that was kind of a fatigue factor setting in for Kansas State because you could tell in some of those offensive rebounds that they surrendered to uh, Baylor that you could, they were also ball watching, uh, legs getting heavy. Uh, they played in a like a lot of overtime games already this season, five up to this point, I believe, won them all. Um, but you're also playing with not the longest bench either, especially Tyler Perry because there's not a point guard other than him on this team that's available. Data Ames, again, did not play. I think we kind of had a back-and-forth conversation during the game at one point. But it did. It does come down to this succinctly. Uh, two things. One is Kansas State had to play elite defense and work their butts off to defend Baylor and keep them down. I didn't feel like Baylor had to work as hard on the defensive end. So that's where I probably started to lose some confidence. Uh, you know, on the other side of the things that we talked about, because I was like, man, this could be another heartbreaker for Kansas State. You're like, well, that happens when you have an elite defense and a pretty lackluster offense, which is probably being kind. And even Tyler Perry offered up his own criticism of their offense that we've been pretty bad. So... What I would say is Kansas State's defense is going to keep them in just about every game as long as they bring it on that end, and for the most part they do. I think uh, the only time they, they thought Gaines kind of got away from them was early in, earlier in the year when the defense wasn't fully developed and against Nebraska where they just laid a duck. Their defense is good enough to keep them in any game, probably against any team in the country. Their offense is bad enough to also keep them in the game with just about any team in the country. That's why you've seen North Alabama, Chicago State, Oral Roberts, games like that. That's why, you know, heck, we're going to be back here Saturday against Oklahoma State, and it'll probably be tight. Um, now, they did blow out UCF, did blow out West Virginia, so if they do have some semblance of an offense, they're probably going to pull away. But, if that, you know, defense is something that you can sustain more easily game after game. So if you'd rather have one, it's probably defense, but your offense can't be this bad uh, – you know, night in and night out. Well, and, and Jerome Tang kind of talked about it, but I think it shocks up this. K-State, their defense is so good that it puts them in a position to be either a really good team or possibly one of the most frustrating, if not the most frustrating, K-State basketball teams to watch over the last 15 years now because the defense is – at a level right now, I mean, they're, they're inside the top 40, getting close to inside the top 30 and defensive efficiency. If you look at what they've done, really, probably if you chop out that first part of the season where they're trying to figure it out, it's not a stretch to say that this is one of the best defensive teams in the country. And I thought tonight 
they had to face kind of a different offensive set than what they're used to with Baylor, and they handled it well. And a lot of that's a credit to Jerome Tang and his staff for having the confidence and guys that could go out and get the job done. They were rotating. They were switching really well. And Scott Drew complimented the length after the game, too. He said K-State's a team that had NBA length, and that's what made it tough on them. So K-State executed really well. You mentioned the bench earlier. You got some performances from guys that we're not normally accustomed to. At this point, we are used to seeing Dorian Finister get out there on the floor. He's, got, he's a dude now. Not maybe not in that sense, but yeah, no, yeah but but he's a guy that they can count on. Yep, and he and he whenever he's in there, he has made some high energy, momentum swinging type plays. And then you think about the other guys that got in. R.J. Jones hits a big three in overtime. He had the pa- he had the he had a pass to. Well, he had, he had, the, he had the, kick to out to yeah. Yeah, the kick out to Kaluma off the offensive rebound from David Gasson. And then Jarrell Colbert got big minutes in the first half, saw six minutes in the second half, and he gave them a good boost. When Will McNair struggled in the first half, he was better in some areas in the second half. He got tough rebounds in overtime, yep. yep. Which was a good deal. So K-State, uh, it's not consistent depth. It's not depth that's going to score a ton for you, but they are starting to find guys to where – you at least have more guys coming off the bench that you trust in certain moments, and you can at least turn to if one guy is struggling, you can go from there. One other thing that I will point out from this game that I really liked, and who knows how much it means going forward, but I I really appreciate and respect this. After the game, I asked Tyler Perry about his shooting because, as we all know, Tyler Perry came in, he was billed as a great shooter. He was over 40% both seasons at North Texas. This year he's under 33% still. He had another tough night from three, one of eight. The one three was awesome. More of that, more confidence, more transition, whatever, getting open looks. I asked him about it, and he gave an answer, and, and the answer was fine. What I really like, though, and what I think is a big step in the right direction about this team is how Arthur Kaluma stepped up immediately after and stepped in to defend Tyler Perry and talk about how the team's still at his back and all these different things. So go watch the press conference if you haven't. But that impressed me because it may not mean anything in the grand scheme of things, but I think we're seeing a different type of team, a team that needs some leadership in moments. And tonight what I saw from Arthur Kaluma was he was a leader on the floor by hitting the big three to win the game essentially for K-State, and he was a leader off the floor with what he said in, in the press room. So I give major credit to Arthur Kaluma, and I think that's a huge step for this K-State team. And, and I think it can, mean, it can actually mean something in the grand scheme of things because a team that cares about one another really grows together, and you get a little bit more cohesion and chemistry, and, and, you, still, and you see better results. And when you like each other, you, you have more fun. Like you, you feel better about yourself. You play better. I mean, that, that's literally a thing, and you're starting to see that. I had the same thing when you asked that question, and Arthur Kaluma stepped up. He wasn't a part of that question. He wasn't a part of that answer. It could have been next question, next person asked. Instead, Arthur was like, you basically said, hold up. I have something to say. Um, so I, I took a lot from that as well. And I think it's a product of how this team's coming together as a whole because, you know, other that was the most significant part I took from the, the press conference in general. The next one was, you know, we heard a couple weeks ago when Jerome Tang said Taj Manning volunteered to go on this, the, the scout team. And then the very next game, he has the, the big plays against Chicago State. You don't want big plays to beat Chicago State, but they needed it, and they got it from Taj Manning after he volunteered to be on the scout team. R.J. Jones volunteered to be on the scout team this week. Jarrell Colbert volunteered to be on the scout team this week. I, I think you're seeing this team, they're still going to make you pull your hair out, but they're coming together, and they'll probably have to win the ugly a lot this year, but... Typically, when a team starts to come together like this, you see those moments. You see guys talk about each other this way, the selflessness that they're showing for each other. I don't know, you know, from a 1 to 10, 1 to 11, that this team is super talented. I think it's good enough to make the NCAA tournament. Their offense is capable of being better than it is. But I think they can reach their ceiling and maybe exceed their expectations and ceiling because of how they're starting to be selfless with one another. And I will say this, the Kaluma thing about stepping up, defending Tyler Perry, not just letting it go, and obviously being somebody that cares about his teammates, and then the other guys being selfless and volunteering for the scout team and whatever else, that is something that it provides you the opportunity, I'll use the term, it maximizes your opportunity to get better and see growth in the areas of shooting and everything. This is not a team that these guys aren't going to doubt each other, and they're going to be encouraging, and you're going to see them, you know, it, 
it's essentially the the long version of you know keep shooting. Yeah. A guy like Tyler Perry, he's not going to have guys that don't make that extra pass to get it to him. A guy like you know R.J. Jones, when he's in the game, they're going to treat him like he is Arthur Kaluma or Cam Carter. And Finister. Yeah, Finister and R.J., they both were trusted by their teammates to knock down some big shots tonight. Um, that, that's a big thing. What I will say is, do you see the product of this kind of coming together like this? I will say it's probably Jerome Tang's best trade as a head coach because I don't know the ins and outs of how he creates this, but he did this last year, and he also creates a great bond between a fan base and the team and kind of – you know, develops that connection and makes the fans invest more, the students invest more because they feel like they're they're one. You, you know, when they walk around and give everybody a high five after each game, win or loss. I I don't know. I don't know what it is. I couldn't name it how he produces it, but he has a coach Tang has a knack for creating this selflessness and cohesion within his locker room and manifesting it across the fan base and community as well. I had non K State fans texting me after this game complimenting Jerome Tang and saying that this is what makes Jerome Tang so impressive and proves that he's the real deal is that this team in a much different way than last year different circumstances all that he's still finding ways to make them competitive and also obviously succeed in some ways they'll get another chance to succeed in front of the home crowd on Saturday six o'clock with Oklahoma State we'll see how that goes good chance for a double feature too if you're in town early because the K-State women play KU at one o'clock uh, so the number seven ranked team in the country. After they go on the road and play TCU tomorrow night, they're back here in Bramlage as well. Two things. I'm not I, typically someone that bangs the attendance drum, but the women's basketball team is probably worthy of people coming out. They're a good watch, and they're number seven in the country. I mean, it's an entertaining brand of basketball too. So, I, you know, they're deserving of that, um, and, and they're going to play better in a packed house too, just like the men would, right? Because <laughs> this, place, this place was buzzing tonight. Secondly, I would say – I think I've said this probably 20 times, written and on shows the last two weeks, that 4-1 and one is on the table. Yep. Maybe not the conventional way of doing it because it involved being a top-10 team, but 4-1 and one is on the table, and all you got to do is be one of the worst teams in the Big 12. Yeah, just don't be that team that loses to Oklahoma State because I am, I'm, I'm not trying to you know, jinx anything. Oklahoma State is capable of going 0-18 in the Big 12, and I didn't think we'd see a team do that since TCU. I mean, they were putrid against KU tonight at home. Mike Boynton is a is a clown show uh, of, of a coach, probably a really nice guy, always seems like it, but... He is a really nice guy. The dude's just not cut out for uh, the Big 12, it would appear. So, he, what kind of dog is Mike Boynton in Kelvin Sampson's view? Uh, am I missing something here? I don't know. Oh, you, Kelvin Sampson's quote about, you know, he doesn't... In the AAC... There was a dog park that he, you know, all this about being the top dog and nobody scared him in the Big 12. Everybody's like a big dog and all this. I, I guess I would say that that probably makes Mike Boynton like a cat or something. He's not even a dog. So. Yeah, well, Houston's having a rough introduction to the Big 12 out on the road, but everyone's having that done to him. Yep. That's why we talked about it. It's important for K-State how they're playing right now. If you can defend your home court and do what they did last week where even a, you get a split on the road, you win a handful of road games, defend home court, you're going to make yourself an NCAA tournament team. They got the much-needed quad one win. They need a few more, but they, that's their first one. Hope Villanova maybe get, plays some pretty good basketball coming up. Maybe that gets into the quad one territory. Like you said, defend home court. I think Jerome Tank's now 26-2 and in Bramlage Coliseum. One of those losses was the, the dud against Nebraska. Um, that's hard on the eyes. And the other one was last year's collapse against Texas. Yeah. One was hard on the eyes. The other was hard on the heart. So uh, not not great there. But good thing tonight for K-State. They win it 68-64 over Baylor. Green over Scott Drew. Uh, Scott Drew, I don't know. My, my, watch out. I did say after the game, I hope that he loses every time he plays Grant McCaslin now because it would just be funny if he cannot beat guys that he employed at one point. So we'll see how it goes. Watch out for North Florida. Driscoll coaches there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And better not put Wichita State on the schedule. There's a lot of scary teams out there for, for Scott Drew. That He's been that good of a coach that now he's bred a whole crew of coaches that can come and uh, beat him. And Jerome Tang's done it three times now, which is impressive. This is the only time the Cats and Bears will play this season. So, for Derek Young, Maybe. Big 12 term. Oh, okay, yeah, good call. Good call, I guess. NCAA Regular season, only time they're going to play. So, for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. We'll be back here on Saturday for the Cats and the Pokes, and then also plenty of coverage all week long over at kstateonline.com, over at On3. Find us there. So, we're out of here. Cats win at 68-64 in overtime.
Cool. D.Y. was going to talk crap on the Cowboys and oh, talk up the Packers, the, but... Yeah, well, well, Green Bay is about to get blasted into oblivion by the 49ers, so... I, ho- I hope the Packers win it all now because I just don't want to see Brock Purdy do anything, and I'd love to laugh at Aaron Rodgers. So we are officially done in Bramble's Coliseum tonight.